again, I greet the saints in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We thank God for keeping us until today, for past Sabbath, till this one. I know it's been a difficult week, in a sense. Uh, it can never be easy. I don't think anybody living in this day and age will say that they had an easy week. It's always been difficult. That is why we tend to appreciate the Sabbath even more, because it gives us rest, it gives us a pause, it gives us a time to reflect, and it also gives us time to really do good work uh, for the mission and the work of God. And so we thank God for the Sabbath and we can recharge and refuel and be out there and doing what God wants us to do. Um, I mean, we all know that actually being a believer is not easy. You know, when, when, when you are not a believer, because you tend not to be aware of things. You are not aware of the spiritual warfare. Uh, even for those who do not, I mean, who venerate ancestors and so forth, they are also aware that there is a, a warfare going. That is why they slaughter. That is why they burn sage. You know, that's why they have an altar in their homes. Because they know there is a spiritual warfare. Now I'm talking about people who don't believe at all. Atheists. And I think sometimes life is easy for them. You know, when you're an atheist, you are so oblivious to everything, you know, everything, when, when bad things happen to you, well, you always write it off as bad debt, you know, it's like, oh, okay, things have happened, okay. Um, when, when, when things are good, you said, well, I worked hard, it's my hard work, and, 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 and so forth. And that is why, perhaps, one of the greatest <coughs> challenges um, in the 21st century is that we are dealing not with people who believe not what you believe, but you are we are dealing with people who don't believe at all. And this belief has also crept in into the church system, into the church life, where you have, um, let me see if I can put it uh, uh, so that it's grammatically correct and it makes sense in English. We have atheistic Christians. I don't know if it makes sense to you. you you're a Christian, but your, your behavior is that of an atheist. Um, and so that is what we are dealing with now. And that is why, when, especially in South Africa, when you look into the belief systems, now prior to 1994, churches were filled, not just black church, but white church. Churches were filled, people were going to church. But post-94, we've seen a decline in people going to church. Just, we live in, Peter, I mean, we worship in Peterson Street, so it is generally where most churches are here in the CBD. Now, if you were to go on Sunday and, and check on all those churches, you'll find that the numbers has dramatically reduced and has nothing to do with COVID. I know COVID had a role to play, but it has dramatically reduced. Why? Because affordability and this belief that all the good things that are happening in your life, it is the result of your hard work. And that is why people turn not to believe. Because why would you believe if you want hard, are we still together? Why would you go to church if it's you and your hard work that is doing the things? And so that is why we are dealing with atheistic Christians, where even in church, they come to church, but they don't really believe. Most people go to church because they've got nothing else to do on that particular day. Being it on Sabbath, I mean, for me, I grew up in this church, so, you know, most of my Sabbaths, I'm here, I'm in church somewhere. And so when I'm not at church, it's always weird. I remember COVID, how weird it was to be worshipping at home because your, your, your psyche is, is so wired into going to church. And now when we were told that you can't go to church, you have to stay at home, that you are worshipping at home and, and you're doing all the virtual, it was weird. And that is why we couldn't wait to go back to church. And so even with that, there will be people who will be coming to church, but they're not really contributing or getting anything out of it. It's just the mere fact of, oh, I've got nothing else to do. How much TV, TV is boring for me. I can't do anything. I can't go shopping lest I, I bump into a fellow member who's asking me, why am I doing, where am I doing? So people tend to just, you know what, let me just go to church. At least I'm there. But it's a, it's a topic that perhaps we can talk about it on another day when we're just having a discussion of the decline of Christianity. But we thank God nonetheless that we are here. Anyway, without wasting much of your time, let's go into our scripture. Uh, we 
I'm not going to read the whole passage that I read in Psalm 73 from verse 1 to 17, but I'm just going to read um, one verse, well, two verses, one and two, Psalm 73, that's what we are, where we're going to be basing our engagement for this Sabbath morning. And it says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, last night, or rather yesterday morning, uh, a friend of mine had called me in, in a sort of panic. And when she called me yesterday, she was like, Pastor Ayanda, um, I'm having a crisis of faith. And so I said, okay, cool, tell me about it. What, what's, what's the problem? How can we solve this problem? And so she regaled me of a story that she said that in recent weeks she had gotten promoted at her work. And when she got promoted, she got promoted over someone who was sort of geared or people around the office had sort of wanted that person to take over that position. But somehow um, things happened and then she got promoted about that person. And so when that happened, as she was telling me the story, she was saying that when I got promoted, I was not even in the office or rather when the announcement was made, I had gone out somewhere. And so when the announcement was made, I was not even in the office. And so, when she came back to the office, of course they informed her that she got promoted and she was happy, of course. But what, when she came back to the office, what she noticed was that the people who usually, when they were all on the same level, they were kind and good to her. But when she came back after this announcement of a promotion, she realized that these people now were sort of acting funny towards her. They were no longer as friendly as they were prior to the promotion. And, and, and not only that, when she investigated of, of, of what had happened, I mean, she knows there's a promotion, but she never thought that it would drive such a big wedge uh, between her and her colleagues. And so when she dug into the story, she realized that the person who was thought to be promoted or wanted to that promotion or looked for that promotion, she had gone around the office recruiting other people in order to hate on her. And people then obviously also joined in the gang and then they started hating on her. And this because it, it became such a, a, confusion, a confusing time for her. She then engaged God in prayer and fasting in order to get some answers on what was happening in her life because now her work environment had not become so nice because now whenever she goes to work, she has to put on this brave face, she has to fight off people, she has to, you know, you know how it is when you are in a toxic environment. You don't always go with a smile. Your smile ends in the car park. As soon as you enter the office, you know that you have to put on a militant mode. And so that's what it was. And so this thing was also not only causing her stress, but it started frustrating her because now she, she was wondering that why would God put me in a situation, but, but now I find myself not enjoying the, the benefits of being promoted. It seems like the people now that I'm in charge over, they are now undermining me. And so it was a frustration for her because she is a faithful person. You know, she prays all the time. She generally is a good person. And yet she was not immune to the attacks that she was suffering. In the, in the office and so that is why she engaged in prayer and fasting and so when she called me she was like hey this is what I've been doing so far perhaps you can come in with an explanation as to what was happening in the life. Now one of the things I do know that as a rule of the thumb being a God following believer it does not preclude you from life's frustration as we spoke in the morning that we do get frustrated in life. Frustrations in life are part of what we are. Being frustrated in life, it's not something that you can be immune for. You are frustrated all the time. And sometimes life's frustrations 
and, 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 and all of those stuff and stress, they always creep upon us when we least expected it. You know, you've been having a very good day, everything will be going well, and all of a sudden, somebody gives you a call or you receive a text that just changes your whole morning. And you go through the day stressed and wondering, why is this happening to us? And it does happen when all of us, we have a testimony of such, where everything was going well, just before you came to church, there was a call that you had to pick up, and that call changed your whole mood. You, by the time you get to church, your mood is changed because something has stressed you and frustration you had. And we all know what on frustrations of life. I mean, living in South Africa can be a frustration sometimes because you know, and if you've lived outside South Africa, you actually know the potential of the country. You know how good the country can get. I mean, in recent weeks, We've seen South Africa lead on a global scale. And you always sit in your couch watching the news and you'll say to yourself, man, I know my country can be good. Just because of a few bad apples, we find ourselves as a third world country. And that in itself is a frustration. I mean, when you look at the places we live, I mean, our power, we, we are no longer sure when there's no shedding. You are in the darkness and yet you pay. I mean, it's a frustration sometimes living in South Africa. You can't even enjoy your car um, 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 in, in these roads because you are always now you have to drive slow, avoid potholes, because if you don't, it's going to be a burden on you because we are living in a place where certain people, instead of seven, delivering services, you find yourself having to dark and it can cost you. And not only that, that the frustration that you get from living in South Africa. I mean, we, we, are in, we live in constant fear of crime, you know, all the time. If you check in our houses, we have butler guards, we have armed responses, we have this, we have that, we have that, because we fear, we fear what could happen to us? Because we've read in the news, we've seen on the newspaper, a neighbor had just reported that they burgled in their houses. And so also, you live in that frustration. You can't even enjoy your house. It's summer. We are supposed to be living when, when our doors are open, you sleep. You know, you can even sleep in your petrol, but you can't because you know that if you don't lock up your house, somebody will come and frustrate you and take all of this. And, 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 and fears and frustrations of life are not only just limited to the social economic things of South Africa. I mean, I mean, we live in a country where there's high unemployment, high this, high that. The price of living keeps on shooting up. Yesterday, the eggs were cheap. Today, the eggs are costing more than you want to eat. Sometimes you even want to have your own chickens so that you can have your own eggs because everything is just expensive. Fuel is expensive. Just not so long ago, you would pay 10 rand a litre. Now you're paying 23 rand a litre. That is a frustration. Not only that, we're finding that the people who are supposed to give us fuel, they are mixing it with paraffin, especially the diesel car users. Now you have to be very careful which garages to go because if you get that fuel, your car is damaged. You can't go back to the garage and complain. Now you have to fix your car. These are frustrations that you are living in. And all of this you find that the people in power, they are not getting any of the smoke that people on the ground are getting. For instance, if they found dollars in your couch, or underneath your mattress, you'll be talking, you are serving time in jail. And yet the people who are powerful, they found dollars underneath their couches, and yet they're still ruling the country. This is the frustration I am talking about. Certain people will start wars, and they will not be labeled as war criminals, but if we, for instance, South Africa, just decided to invade the Sutu, we'll be dragged through international courts being called war criminals. It just goes to show that the world that we're living in is a frustration. And on top of it, God expects us to be faithful, of which it's also another frustration. And then also to go deeper. Being a church member is also another frustration. Because you find yourself in situations in church where you have to duck and dove members because not everybody who's in church or attends church has a heart of worship. And if somebody is working extra hard to make your living or worship experience even miserable, because even in church, you're not immune to attacks. You will come to church in a jolly mood to preach.
praise the Lord, but there's somebody who's planning something somewhere in order to make your life miserable. And that is why you find people staying at home, not coming to church because they don't want to see certain people. Because as soon as you see that person, your whole mood is going to change. And then people are going to say, but you're going to church for, for God. You're not going to church for people. But I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, when we go to church, yes, God is there. But when we go to church, we're going for you. Are we still together? When we go to church, I'm here, I come to church to see you. But now, if you are making my worship experience very hard, what is the purpose of me coming to church? And so, frustrations are everywhere. And so, then it introduces us to the text that we are focusing on. It is a, a, a psalm of Asaph. Asaph is a Levite, he's a man who is living in the century, and as we know, in the Old Testament, the Levites are people who are who are serving God, who are serving in the century, and we are introduced to Asaph. And Asaph writes a psalm, and as he writes a psalm, it, it, it always presents as a legal argument in court. It seems like he's putting God on trial, and he's caught, and he's presenting his proof on why he is frustrated. And, 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 and Asaph, as we read in Psalm 73, you get to discover that Asaph is almost having a crisis of faith. And this is not a crisis of faith when he's losing faith in God, but he's having a crisis of faith on what is happening around them. I mean, as, as, as I mentioned, that as a Levite, as a somebody who's serving in the century, he has access to God, he handles sacred things daily, yet with all the holy resources that he are at his disposal, he is frustrated with God. Have you ever been frustrated with God? You are a believer, you know God is able, but there are certain things that God seems to do or God seems to let go that leave you frustrated at times. And there are times where as a Bible believer or as a worshiper of God, you find yourself, uh, whenever you are dealing with God, that you come to a point where you see that God does not make sense. Have, have you been in a state where God does something that just, just doesn't make sense? Where God sees injustice happening and God says nothing. Or God does nothing when your life is falling apart. You're going through a bad divorce. God says nothing. Your kids are misbehaving. God says nothing. At work. People are getting up on you. God says nothing. And to the point where you even ask yourself, why do I even bother with God when it seems that God has taken a holiday? You remember, when, when Elijah was facing with the prophets of Baal, one of the things that Elijah said to, to mock the idol, says, maybe your God has gone on holiday. Because there are times when you are dealing with God and your life is a mess, where you feel that God, maybe God took a holiday. You know, he has left a, an email message that is out of office. That your life will be falling apart and you don't even know what was happening. Now, one of the things I have learned, that just because you have access and you have proximity, and you have proximity to God, it doesn't mean that you won't be angry or you won't be frustrated. That just because you know God, just because you read the Bible, just because you pray, just because you have access to God and people turn to think that you have better access than they are, it doesn't mean that you are excluded from frustrations in life. Now, this session by Asaph, as I've mentioned, it's like it presents like a courtroom where Asaph has put God on trial and he has proof of his lawsuit. Now what I love, with, especially with Bible writers and, and, and people that we, write, we read about in the Bible, that they were never scared, whenever they were frustrated with God, they would venture out, you know, they would vent their frustration at God. Now, 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 most of us, and I think this is where sometimes we lose the plot, is that when we are frustrated with God, we let our frustration out on people who have nothing to do with what God is doing in our lives. Because there are times where God is an instigator of your frustration. There are times where God is the, he's the main character. Your life is falling apart, but God is also the instigator. He's instigating it. And instead of questioning God and saying, God, why are you silent when my life is falling apart? Instead, you come to church and persecute me. 
Now, I have nothing to do with what God is doing in your life. And I have learned, you know, one of the things, it's a hard lesson, but I have learned that, you know, when somebody is going through a hard time, the best thing I can do for that person is pray for them. I cannot get into the line between what God is doing in their life. I can pray for you and fast for you and hope that God intervenes in your life. But I am not going to be a messiah in your life because I do not know who's the instigator here. It could be God. Because if it's the devil who's instigating the hard things in your life, at least we can run to God. Are we still together? When, when Satan is against you, at least you know that, hey, I've got God I can run to. Now, who do you run to when God is the instigator of your problems? And so that is why sometimes we can never intervene in people's problems. That is why we can only pray for them and give them good counsel, direct them to where the problems are and where problems are solved, and leave it alone. Because the moment, the moment you try to intervene in a problem when you don't even know where they started, God will come for you. And then you won't even know where it started. And so that is the, 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 the problem. And, 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 and what I'm trying to say is that there, what I love with the biblical authors is that they're never afraid to vent out their frustration. When, when, when Joel was having a, a, a crisis of faith, he never vented it out on his wife, he never vented it out on his friends, but he addressed God. When David had problems, he vented it out on God. When Jeremiah had problems, he vented it out on God. And perhaps it's a lesson that we need to learn, that when we, our lives, are going through a mess, one of the things that the person that we need to take our problems to is Jesus. Like the song says, I must tell Jesus all of my sorrows, for I cannot bear these burdens alone. Now, when he starts his argument in Psalms 73, and, 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 and it pins him, it's almost like a premise of his argument, and which is very interesting, Asaph starts this um, argument, or starts his argument by highlighting the goodness of God. He says, surely God is good to Israel. And by doing this, what Asaph is trying to say, he says, listen, my crisis of faith or my frustration is not coming from a place of being a heretic. Because most of the time, when people have issues with God, it's because with their time they are living. Are, are we still together? When people are having issues with God and they vent it out, in fact, more or less, it's when they are leaving God. But when Isaac is having this crisis of faith, he says, listen, you, you, you don't need to explain to me the goodness of God. Because I know that God is good. And all the time, God is good. He says that. He says, God is good. Not only is God good to me, but also God is good to Israel. He says, the goodness of God as a people of faith in Israel is well documented. God was good in the beginning. God was good to Abraham. God was good to the patriarchs. God gave us a land. God is good. He took us to captivity. He brought us back. We know that God is good. Are we still together? And, and, and he further goes to say, man, I'm not a heretic. I'm not a backslider. I know that God is good. I know how good God can be. I've seen it. And also the history of the people is filled with stories of God's goodness. And not only that, but also God is good to those who are pure in heart. He says, man, people who are good in heart, God is good to them. If you are good, God will be good to you. So we don't have a problem with that. This is not a theological, oh, I'm, 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 I'm leaving the faith. But then, as he goes to verse 2, this is where his problem is. And, and, and in the backdrop of this story, we're not really familiar who was he directed to, whether he was directing it to the people outside of Israel or Israel. But it is my assertion that when, when Asaph was observing this, he was observing it amongst the people of God, the people of faith. And then he goes, he says, in verse chapter 2, I mean verse 2 of 73, he says, But for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. What he's saying that, hey man, I know God is good. I know the goodness of God. But for me, I almost lost faith. Now, if you just picked up the, the text from verse 2, 
You'll be concerned, he says, man, what would be so big that would make this guy almost slip, almost backslide? What is it that is frustrating him that he would backslide? And by the way, backsliding in the faith is not a new thing. You remember Jonah? Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, and then he went to Tarshish. But God, in his divine way, he engineered for him to end up in Nineveh. And then after he did what he was supposed to do, the Bible says that Jonah ended up under the tree, frustrated. Not frustrated that God is good, but he was frustrated that he never saw the destruction. You know, <laughs> sometimes the most evil of people are not people who do not know God. Sometimes it's the people who know God. Because Jonah, the prophet of God, was frustrated that God did not destroy the, the, the Syrians, the devil. And so he was even backsliding. And so with Asaph, what he was saying, he said his frustration was so deep that he, it almost caused him to quit. Have you been in situations where you've been so frustrated with life or church that you had to reevaluate your position in life? That things are not working out so well that you're so frustrated that you want to really quit. And, 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 and furthermore, as you read the following verses, I think he goes deep into it, that nothing would destabilize you more than seeing the wickedness, or rather the wicked people get ahead in life. Uh, I remember when we, uh, when I was growing up in, in, the, in the township, in fact, you, you would even see this uh, even in social media, it's even documented in, in television, that the people who are criminals, they get ahead in life. They, they have the nice cops. They have the nice girls. I mean, they have money. You are waking up to go to school, go everywhere to hustle hard. And the weekend, and you know this, people, you know we had this neighbor uh, while we still stayed in the township. We didn't know what this guy does. We didn't know what he did. He, he lived opposite our house. But every morning, he had a nice car here. He lived in a nice four room. You know those four rooms, painted it nice. It had, uh, it, it was really nice. It was really nice. It was white and everything. I mean, in our street, we were okay. But this guy, we didn't know what he did. He drove a nice car. His life was okay. And, and, and this sometimes would frustrate a believer. Have you never been frustrated by people who are doing heists they never get caught. They always have money. They always get away with things. Doesn't that frustrate you? And yet you have to wake up in the morning. You have to work extra hard. You have to deal with an impossible boss. You have to deal with impossible colleagues. You have to deal with impossible situations. And yet the people who are wicked, who are doing all these wicked things, pushing narcotics all over this place, they are seemingly getting away with life and you have to work extra hard. It will frustrate me. It frustrates me to this day, but what can we do? And so Asaph, when he was looking at this, he says, man, these people, they are so wicked and yet they are getting on with life. He is having an argument with God. He says, God, have you taken a break where you are looking at people who are wicked and nothing is happening to them? In fact, as he goes, he says, their toxicity has a following. Cruel people have a fans. If you keep on reading the text, Asaph says, man, these people who are toxic, who are wicked, not only are they wicked by themselves, but they have a following. Yeah. Have you noticed that toxic people can never be alone? Oh, you guys don't know toxic people. I'm not talking about toxic people at work. At least that we can write you off. They don't know God. But I'm talking about toxic people at church. You know toxic people at church? They, they are clique leaders. They have a gang of people. They, they, they will tell you that they don't like me. And, and, and for whatever reason, they don't like me. Maybe they don't like the way I cut my hair. Maybe they don't like the shape of my glasses or whatever. And because they are toxic, they can't keep it to themselves. That I just don't like I am. But now, they will go to the next person. Says, I don't like that guy. You know, that guy is this and this and this. And another thing, toxic people are not poor. You can never be poor and be toxic. Toxic people, as the Bible says, are people who are getting ahead in life. Because as they are bringing their toxicity, 
They got a financial muscle and they go to their people who they know that they are supporting financial or they put you to work. You know, you know the people who has helped you in life and somehow maybe gives you a stipend now and again, gives you money, gives you work. Whenever they say something, even though you know it's wrong, but because they've got money, they have you by the short and curlies and you will start hating their enemies because you know if you stand for the right, the financial tap will close. Are we still together? And that is why when Illinois says the greatest one of this earth is the one of men and women who will not be bought. Because we, the people who are toxic, they, they have something. They, they have influence. And they would have influenced the church. They would be chaotic. But they have influenced the church because they've got money. In this church of ours, you can never be influenced. There are two ways you can be influential. Either you're a good preacher, good singer, or you've got money. And the third part, if you are influential and you have money, you will say the most outrageous things. Because you've paid half of the church. They won't even sit down and say, I, brother, I, I think you've got it wrong here. Because they know that down the line they're feeding you. And so that is why you have to be careful who feeds you. Because the people who feed you, one day they'll come and collect. They've got receipts of what they did. And so Asaph he says, man, these people are recruiting people. And they're, they're all are wicked. And on top of it, as you read the text, they said, man, these guys, it even suggests that they even go against God and God says nothing. If you read the text, they, they scoff. Their calluses have no limits. Their iniquity keeps on going. They clothe themselves with violence. You know, as I said, you know, toxic people from outside church, I don't mind. It's, it's toxic people. But people at church, they become so toxic, they always threaten people. They'll keep, you know, they'll, they'll chase you from church, kick you from church, and they have no regret about all of that. And so, based on the text, as I suggest that this, this people that Asaph is focusing this, it, it seems that they're coming from the people of faith. They're cruelty, and cruelty in the faith is always crushing. And they do this, and they do as they please, because they somehow seem to be challenging the goodness of God. And nothing seems to be happening to them. There's nothing more frustrating when you see evil people keep on going on and nothing seems to be happening to them. It seems cruel people or toxic people, especially church, it keeps on going, they keep on living. They live until the end, they, until they die of old age. You know, if you read the story of the, um, these guys the, who, 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 who were massacring and, and killing Jews in, 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 during the Second World War, most of them, they lived until the 90s, until 100. So you can imagine you're killing people and you're living with this conscience. And I've always wondered, why God would you keep quiet when, and you let these people have a long life? Because the Bible tells us that honor your father and your mother so that you can live long. But then it seems that the people who are doing cruel things in life, they seem to live longer. Whereas the person who's good in life, they die of cancer. And those who are doing good or doing evil, they live long. And I don't know why, but it is. And, and, and so, when, when he was looking at all of these things, this is the part where Asaph was having a frustration, a crisis of faith, and says, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? They even challenge your authority. They even come into your house and do things and, and, and since you do not do anything. These wicked people, they do not have a care. They live a carefree life and they go on to a mass life. These people keep on getting promotions at work. Nothing seems to be happening. Their kids are going to university. Their kids, everything is going around. But yet they are wicked. Why, God, are you allowing this to happen? And this is the source of Asa that is causing him to backslide because he says, man, I think what I'm doing, I'm not doing God right. Because I'm, I've been faithful, I'm serving in the temple, I'm doing all the things that God wants me to do, and yet I'm not progressing. And yet these people who have no care in the world, they don't care about God, they are cruel to people, they are wicked, and yet they are getting their things uh, put together. And so just before that happens, just before he considers backsliding, 
What Asaph says, he says, man, I wish I could give up. But the only thing, you read this all the way from verse 15 going down, that the only thing that keeps him from backsliding is his community. Because Asaph, what he's saying is that, man, as much as I want to give up, and giving up my job as a Levite and serving in the sanctuary and all of that would be so easy for me. I don't have to do the, the, the deep things of God. I don't have to do this. I don't have to serve people. I can just be by myself. But the only thing that has stopped me from quitting, the only thing that has stopped me from not resigning as a Levite and not resigning as a person of faith and not staying at home and just giving up on faith is the fact that I have a community. And he says, my calling is attached to my community. You know the reason why most pastors don't quit? They don't quit because things are nice. They don't quit because they know, if I quit, my calling is connected to a lot of people. If I quit, a lot of people will quit. Sometimes we don't quit, not because we want to endure the abuse that sometimes comes from church. Sometimes you don't want to quit because all of these things, but you don't want to quit because you know that somebody is holding on to God because you are holding on. And if you quit, someone else will quit. If they say, man, if he gave up, then who am I? And so that is why Asaph said, man, I was close to it. Like, if I were to tell you testimonies, I've been through things where I had all the right to say, you know what, God, I think I can just chill and just be a regular member and not participate in church and just be okay. Because especially once you take up the calling, you tend to see the wickedness. You tend to see things that you shouldn't see. You tend to hear things you're, supposed to, you're not supposed to hear. But just because you know that your calling is giving somebody else's hope, you hold on. And that is what Asaph does. He says, man, I stayed in the place where I'm staying because my community is connected to other people. Some people are holding on because I'm holding on. I cannot quit. That is why you cannot quit. That is why you cannot stay at home. Because even though people may not tell you, some of them are believing because you are still believing. Some people are praying because you are still praying. So if you were to give up and stay at home, they'll say, then what is the purpose? What is the need for me to be holding on? And I love verse 17, which actually makes everything even much more easier. Asaph says, as I considered all of these things, as I looked into the wickedness of people and all the pressures and stresses I've gone through in my own life and and, and seeing all these people and presenting this argument to God and God, why are you quiet and all of these things? Then in verse 17, Asaph says, Then I went into the sanctuary. He says, I went and had a worship. He says, Just before I could quit, just before I can draft and send in that resignation letter, just before I could send that letter to the church board and say, Man, remove my name from your church records. What Asaph is saying, then I went into the sanctuary. Because in the sanctuary, that's where all answers are revealed. When he went to the sanctuary, he says, man, I went to worship. And when I went to worship, the Bible tells me that then I understood their destiny. You know, once God becomes silent, you don't stay at home until God answers you. The Bible says, go where you find God and have a worship experience with God. And once you have an experience with God, then you would understand why your colleague is doing what he's doing to you. Why the next church member is doing the things that you're doing to you. And what I love with God, once you engage God, God gives you answers. When, when, when Asaph went into the sanctuary, he had another encounter with God, and God gave him providence. You know the word providence? It comes from the word provision. Provision it is a pro, it's something that is yet to happen. And vision is seeing things that are about to happen. So when you get that word together, it's provision, and later it's providence. So what Asaph is saying, 
that as soon as I went into the sanctuary, as soon as I had a worship experience, as soon as God elevated me to the higher heavens, I got to see the future. I got to see that these wicked people have no uh, happiness. These wicked people are abusing people because they have no peace. I can tell you this, my brothers and sisters, that nobody abuses somebody and because it comes from the goodness of their heart. It's because they are having a hard time. And instead of having their hard time off by themselves, they'll come to church and blurt it out to you. And so when Asaph says, he says, I went into the sanctuary and then I saw their end. I saw and I understood their final destiny. So, don't take for granted God's presence. And that is why, at the end, when we come to church, we come to a place where we see God and, 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 and have His presence. We come to church to sense and sense and, 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 and come to worship. And so, don't look down on worship. It might not be like the other churches, but when you get and engage God in worship, the Bible says that God tends to reveal things that you never saw. Talk about Paul and Silas. They were beaten, stricken, and stripped of everything. But as soon as they engaged God in worship, the Bible tells me that the, the jail cells started to rock. Because worship has answers for our lives. When John the Revelator was in the Isle of Patmos, when he was left alone or uh, abandoned, the Bible says that when he was on the Lord's day, when he was in the Spirit, God gave him a vision on things to come. I can talk about Joshua. I can talk about the three Hebrew boys. When they were thrown into the fire, the Bible tells me, inside the fire, they had a worship experience and Jesus joined them in there. And so that is why when we have worship, we don't look at the numbers, but we look at what God is doing in their lives. So no matter how much of a mess your life has been, before you give up, I would recommend that you start in the sanctuary. That you can start with God and let Him reveal the goodness of God. As the Bible would say, test and see that the Lord is good. That when you magnify His name of the Lord, you see how God indeed is. When you, make, when you praise God in the sanctuary in the firmament of His power, you will understand when David says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. When you go into the sanctuary, you will understand why Job says, I know my redeemer lives. He's a man who had boils from head to toe. But at the end, when he said, he testifies, he says, I know my redeemer lives. Because when you are in the temple, in, in the sanctuary and praise God, you will sing the song that says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. When you go into the sanctuary, you know and appreciate the song that turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face, and the things of this world will turn strangely grim in the presence of his love and grace. And when you go into the sanctuary, you would understand the text that says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask by the power that is in work within us. When you go into the sanctuary, you would understand why your frustrations are sorted. So my brothers and sisters, in the end, I know we are frustrated in life. I know sometimes we are frustrated by church members. I know life might not always be easy, socioeconomically, whichever way. And I know that every day it is a struggle to get up. As soon as you want to get up, you want to give up. Because you just, you even wonder, what's the purpose? Because as soon as I get up, I'm going to get back down. But the beauty of a, a Christian life is getting up when you've been knocked down. That you don't give up until God says so. And until you, God says so and he sends you a message that you can give up, you'll never give up. And above all else, when we get into the temple and worship, that is when you realize that God will reveal his will into our lives. And so may God bless us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.